So that pretty much concludes uh, my presentation. I can get into any uh, questions or issues that you may be having with urban wildlife. Yes, sir. Okay. To ask a question. Yeah. If you could uh, raise your hand, and Matt will come over with the microphone. And uh, if you have any questions for Norm North as well, uh, with the Goose presentation, he's also available to answer questions. So if you can let uh, let us know which speaker your question is for, that would be great. Okay. So with all the damage these guys can do to your home, if uh, I've got some raccoons living under our deck, and uh, after watching all this, I'm afraid if I close up that deck so they can't get in anymore and get rid of them, that they'll just go rip the roof apart or something to actually get into the house. Right now, they're not doing any damage. They don't even go into our garbage. They, they get out and they go off into the neighborhood at night and then they come back to the sanctuary of our home, you know, like, but uh, so what do you do? Raccoons are typically creatures of habit, so they'll follow the same route every night looking for a food source. So that may explain why you're not seeing them. Also, it's a learned behavior. Typical ra typically, raccoons that live under a deck will live under another deck or under another shed. Raccoons are living in a, a chimney will live in another chimney. Raccoons are living in an attic will live in another attic. Um, years ago, we used to study how we got raccoons out, what methods we used, where we put the babies in our baby box, and we put an ear tag in every raccoon. Uh, we caught over 400 raccoons, and we only ever caught the same raccoon on two, two occasions. So, you know, people tend to think, oh, they're just going to go to my neighbors and be in there. No, they have these other den sites somewhere else where they know it's safe and secure. So, um, if you don't mind them under your deck, I would then look at animal proofing your, your roof. You know, putting screens on your chimney, putting screens on, on those vents on the roof. Uh, plumbing systems, there, there's pipes, every home has a plumbing system that exhausts the, uh, the, the plumbing of the home. Uh, screening those type of things, those soffits, especially where, they, where the downspout comes down. Uh, getting up there with some screws and, and, and anchoring that into place. Um, and, and once again, on a quarterly basis, getting up on your roof and, and doing a thorough inspection to make certain that, that you're secured. So I'm right below where you're talking about, upper middle, six line, little okay. 16 mile creek. We got Ricky Raccoon <laughs> and all his family. So we've had squirrels in the attic, got rid of them, got the soffits, everything. You know what they're still doing though? The raccoons are still coming along the fence, they hop on my deck and they poop. They don't just poop way over there or way over there, they poop right where I come out on my sliding glass door. And that poop is toxic. It's, yes. So I wear gloves and I wear a mask, yes. but how can I keep them from, so there's no food anywhere. Right. Okay. There's no garbage out, there's nothing. They just come up and poop. <laughs> Once again, being that they're a creature of habit, they're creature of habits, so they found that as a nice latrine area. Raccoons tend to uh, have a few la latrine areas in a neighborhood, um, which obviously, unfortunately, is, is your, your deck. Well, a couple of things you can do. One is, yes, being diligent by cleaning it immediately. There is a microscopic roundworm in raccoon feces called Bailus ascaris, which, if ever ingested in the human system, can cause blindness, uh, neurolog neurological damage. Um, about five years ago, there was a toddler in Hamilton that um, uh, the parents were on the balcony, which had a lot of raccoon feces, and they, they walked into the apartment and had uh, the microscopic roundworms on their, on their shoes, and the toddler walked on and put his fingers in his mouth and, and, uh, and unfortunately, um, you know, very sick. So any, even, even your blue bins, because raccoons have been in your blue bins if they're outside at night. I would take them to the curb, either wear gloves, disposable gloves, throw them out, or when you come into your home, don't touch anything and wash your hands immediately. Um, because it's a, it's a growing concern, this, this raccoon uh, roundworm, Bailus ascaris as it's called. Um, in terms of keeping them off the deck, there is one simple device. Um, it's called a scarecrow, and it's a motion sensored sprinkler. I'm actually, I'm actually using it in my backyard for squirrels. They're burying their nuts all in my gardens and, and lawns. So, um, it, it's on a, a motion sensor, so when it sees something moving, it comes on, goes one way, goes off, and then, and then turns off. So uh, the element of surprise, the, uh, the, the noise, and the water, eventually the raccoon will go to somebody else's deck where he's not going to get wet. So that's a, you can, I think um, uh, Home Depot uh, sells them, and they're maybe 60 or $70, but a good 
fairly, uh, fairly reasonable priced item to help keep wildlife out of your backyard or you know, front yard or your deck, that type of thing. Uh, a quick question about the chipmunk. How you can get rid of the chipmunk? Sorry, you had a few, had a couple of chipmunks in your home? Yeah, around the garage. Around the garage. Chipmunks, um, yes, they can, they don't typically get into attic spaces. They're more of a ground dwelling animal, get in rockery or underneath garage doors, that type of thing. Um, they do hibernate as well, so they're more of a seasonal animal. Um, but if, unless they're, are they, are they ripping the garage, are they in the garage chewing or, or destroying it or, or damage? Okay, so they're chewing the, the rubber of the garage door. Um, so once again, that may be a, a matter that they've been in there before, they know that there's a food source there. So you might wanna have a, a, a garage door company come out and put, there's a, a stronger type of flashing or, or sponge they can put on the bottom, or maybe a, a contractor come up and raise the, the level of the garage floor so that seal is tighter. Any animal, uh, chipmunks, raccoons, squirrels, they need a gap to start chewing. They can't just chew on a flat surface. They need an edge to get their teeth in or claws and start ripping and tearing. So if you make that seal nice and tight, that should uh, stop them from getting into the, to the garage. Thank you. I'm having difficulty with rabbits eating my plants and very selectively. Uh, the expensive ones, right? Well, they just ruined my garden. Ruined garden. So I, I read in Canadian Gardening that, um, it's sort of funny, if you purchase coyote urine and spread it around your property, then that will keep them away. So number one, will that work? And number two, where can I buy that stuff? <laughs> you certainly don't want to be capturing a coyote and trying to get some urine from them, do you? <laughs> um, coyote urine has been known to, to work because it is a predator. Um, normally a hunting store, you could purchase that. Um, but I, I'd go back to the scarecrow uh, motion censored sprinkler as, as a solution, um, which would be a lot more probably effective. Because once again, once, once an animal realizes that there's not a coyote in the backyard and is a predator, similar to uh, one of our props there, we have uh, an owl. You know, people think owls will keep chipmunks or squirrels or birds. Uh, away from their property, but if that owl, that you know, the plastic owls you can purchase, um, if it's not moved every half hour, then the wildlife are going to realize that, it, that it's a fake owl. So um, I, I'd try the scarecrow as, as, a, as a good solution, yeah. This is a question for Norm, and I wondered how many of the geese that you take away come back to Oakville and how quickly? Um, the first number of years we banded some of the birds just to see what they did respond and um, the first roundup was from Mississauga when we did the start started the short distance translocations which are what we do now because we used to ship um, geese to Oklahoma and um, if we shipped them to Oklahoma they didn't come back it was far enough and we shipped them to New Brunswick and they really didn't come back from there again it's a, a long ways away so when I saw the banding data, what we, I looked at how far do the geese migrate sort of naturally, or if we move them, um, how far do they move back and forth on the longitude? And if you, geese tend not to go outside two degrees of longitude in their migration. So now when I move geese, I try to get, you know, as far away as possible, not east and west and not north and south. So the birds we shipped to Mississippi, we shipped them to North Carolina and Funny, none of these people want them anymore, so that's why um, it ended for New Brunswick as our last distance customer, and they said, no more, we have enough geese, and so we did the short distance. So the first couple of years, we banned the birds to see how fast they came back, and the first shipment went from Mississauga down to Long Point. We moved about 500 birds then, and about 15% when, when they were able to fly, like after July 15th, I was going on the waterfront, and about 15% came back. And then the next year, we decided, let's ban some geese along the waterfront and leave them, and some we will ship. So the geese we ban and leave on the waterfront, since there's a hunting season in the rural area, we had about a 4% recovery. If we moved, then there's about 20% of the birds harvested. Now there's all different things involved with reporting rates and all that. Um, so they don't come back for various reasons. If you move them far enough to Oklahoma, they can't find their way, you discombobulate them. Um, if you move them short distances, they can come back right away. The ones, one year we had a summer camp, 
in Oakville. We just moved them basically up the road and they all came back, like it's instantaneous. So the further you move them east and west, less likely. If you move them, birds migrate north and south, Canada geese um, nest up in um, Hudson Bay and James Bay. And all. So if you move them way up there, it doesn't matter. You know, fall or winter, they're gonna um, come back or fall or in spring. Um, when they pass through, and the birds that are goslings here that hatch out, for instance, in Oakville area, quite likely would go up the next year as sub-adults, which mean non-breeders, that takes three years for a goose to start breeding, but in the second year they would, could be up on James and Hudson Bay. So some of the birds we banded here naturally go north to molt their feathers and then come back again. So it's important to move them. So how many come back? It depends on how far we move them. Um, we tend to move them to rural areas. Um, some of our data is a little bit earlier. Um, goose seasons have been open quite a bit and the number of birds you can actually shoot per day and possess per day has increased a lot. So um, we, we haven't banded any birds recently on the, trans, um, the birds from Oakville. So it could be something. So that's not a very good answer, but it just gives you, it's highly variable. Um, but they don't, if they came back, we could fill that truck in one park, in Miss Ogwen one park, we had got 846 geese on the first time we started moving the geese. And now, last year we went there, was the first year we didn't catch any birds. But typically we'd catch maybe 20 to 30. But originally before we started the roundups, there's about 800 birds in that park. Um, so, some come back, 15%. If somebody said pick a number, I'd say 15%. As soon as they can flight the, get their flight feathers back, about July 15th, will immediately come back to Oakville because, but a lot of the birds that arrive in Oakville that we put in the truck be, um, may have come, if we move them to Elmer, that's maybe where those birds come from because they do, all birds, all geese and ducks do a molt migration. So the birds that come to Oakville may not necessarily be Oakville birds. They could be coming from Pennsylvania, New York, Elmer. They fly from Elmer to Oakville to molt their feathers because they want big water fronts, a lot of water. We put them in the truck, ship them right back home. So. It's, it's a kind of a complex issue, but a lot fewer come back, as we can see from the graphs. They're declining. Sorry, it's just a question for Bill, actually. Um, we actually did have your services for a raccoon, did a great job, and uh, right, raccoon never came back. But uh, we do have squirrels that chew on the outside of the windows. And I did, or my wife did, actually stew some... Uh, uh, I can't remember how strong the peppers were, but anyways, we uh, then used a paintbrush and went over. It seemed to stop them from doing it for at least one season, but I'm not sure if there's a better solution for that. Uh, anyways, uh, certainly we'd be willing to hear it because they've been chewing the heck out of some of the windows. Sure, I, I feel for even at our office, they chewed through our, our uh, window screen. <laughs> and completely destroyed it. But once again, these are typically young squirrels that are, that are learning, getting their, their land legs. Um, you know, they're up and down walls and, and whatnot, learning to climb. Um, and, you know, they'll just chew on that wood to get their, their teeth at that proper length. There is a product called uh, Ropel, R-O hyphen P-E-L. Um, very bitter tasting, make sure you're wearing a mask and gloves, because, you know, if you get it on your face, you'll taste it for weeks on end. Um, now we've had mixed results with it. Sometimes they, they hate it and they won't go near it. Other times some of them love it. So you might want to try it on a very sample area and, and, and see how that goes. Um, but that's one product that I know is out there. Uh, this is for Bill as well. Um, we've had an infestation of mice in our house where we've had every room is torn apart. Uh, all the walls, all the ceilings. A very shabby builder uh, because there were holes all throughout the house where the mice were getting in, the squirrels were getting in as well. One of the things that our contractors put in our yard is a, a device that emits some kind of, I don't know if it's a sonar or what it is, but are they effective at all? Uh, unfortunately not. But somebody's making, them, somebody's making a lot of money off them. They bought them at Home Depot, by the way. Oh, did they? Yeah. <laughs> Basically, with, with any wildlife, it's some type of physical barrier to stop them from getting in a structure. Um, you know, there, there's those ultrasonic sounds, as you say, um, 
bunch of other devices on the market, but um, animals will leave a scent behind, whether it's mice, raccoons, bats, skunks, and that scent is how they communicate a mate. So that scent that is there is always attracting other animals back into the area. So, um, you know, putting any any sound device typically typically isn't a solution. So. Um, basically, you know, going around that home and looking at all those cracks and crevices and, and whether it be with a, a good silicone sealant or a, uh, with mice, a, a quarter inch screening that they can't squeeze through or chew through is, is really the solution. Very time consuming and basically, yeah. Well, and like I said, you can see how they, they multiply every 21 days. So, you know, and their mice chew electrical wiring, you know, urinate and defecate, you know, the odors. Um, so you, you kind of want to get out there and start sealing up as much as you can. Oh, is that right? From the mice? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, don't, know if any, I don't know if I've heard of document studies of how it's bring down from mice, but they are, mice are rodents and they need to chew as well, just like squirrels. But I know there has been uh, documented cases with, with houses catching on fire because of squirrels in the attic. So, and of course you can always call us and we can animal proof it for you. <laughs> okay. Okay, we have uh, one last question. This question is also for Bill. Um, I heard that blood meal is good for repelling uh, rabbits or, and some wildlife, is that true? Uh, once again, you're gonna get mixed results, similar to the, you know, putting some type of physical barrier to stop the animal. Animals are gonna realize that it's not a threat with an odor and, and just kind of eventually ignore it. I go back to that scarecrow device that, you know, if an animal is you know, on your lawn um, or coming onto your deck or, or in your garden, you know, eating your flowers, a rabbit, what have you, uh, the scarecrow is a, is a great deterrent, especially with rabbits. They're such a, a small and timid animal. Any sound or whatnot will, will, will scare them away. And if you've got a scarecrow in your garden, keeping them out of your garden, and your neighbor doesn't, well, they're going to go to the easy food source. And, and that's true with all urban wildlife. Yeah. So. You got time for one more? Or? Yes, possums, same thing. They're, uh, they're becoming more and more prevalent. 15 years ago, we only saw them in the Niagara region, and they've been, over the past 20 years, kind of slowly making their way around the lake uh, into Toronto, but um, same thing, the, the scarecrow would keep an opossum out of your yard, and you know, the old saying, playing possum, that, that's exactly what they do when they're threatened. And a lot of times we get the calls, people saying, I got a rat this big in my backyard. Okay, has it got a, you know, a pink nose and a long tail? Well, that's probably not a rat, it's an opossum. Interesting animal, the only marsupial in North America and the, has the most teeth of, of any other, any mammal in North America as well. But a very uh, strange looking animal. Some people think they're very cute, but <laughs> the eye of the beholder. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, Home Depot for coming out tonight uh, and with their products and some information. And uh, I'd also like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it and that you got a lot of useful information. And please do make use of the town's resources. Uh, like I said, the wildlife strategy, the uh, conflict guidelines, we've got books in the library. And of course, uh, we've got Humane Wildlife Control. And uh, I'd like to thank actually both of our guest speakers also who did a great job. And we actually have Thanks, and again, please help yourself also. We've got the resources out in the back. Thanks.